Cranley's 21st Century Reformation is a lifetime of teaching given over 15 intense sessions designed to bring you up to speed with God's kingdom and prepare you for effective ministry like only Winky can. Fasten your seatbelt, Dorothy. This is Winky Prattney. We are continuing to look at uh, this question of sin, but I, I just briefly wanted to touch on the shifting of responsibility before we go now into some amplification of this next major thing. Um, some of these blame shiftings are quite funny. The Genesis 3.12, the woman whom you gave to me, that one. But probably the greatest evidence, biblical evidence of spontaneous evolution uh, takes place when Moses comes down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments freshly given to him by God. There's this big orgy going on there and they're all dancing around a calf, a golden calf. He is so angry with Aaron. And if you read the whole story, it's like, well, it's all your fault. If you hadn't stayed so long up in the mountain, they would have done this. And, you know, I'm not supposed to be in charge here. You know, it's all this thing, see. And Moses just keeps looking at him, and he finally gives this incredible, this is one of the best excuses ever given. So they gave me this gold, and I cast it into the fire, and there came out this cup. That has to be one of the absolute best. My friend who works in Six Mile near M&M's home territory, he's been there for at least uh, 15, 20 years now, he gives money for people who beg for the best excuses, you know. <laughs> so he had one guy said, could you spare a couple of bucks for a cup of coffee? My house blew up. That was good. So he got, he got the cup of coffee. Um, the, we've talked about this point about confession. I've thought long and often about what is the really first step of becoming a Christian? What's the really first step of returning to God? And I'm convinced the bottom line is honesty. That if we will get honest with ourselves and honest with God, even if we're totally dishonest people, then the, the uh, process of God's dealings with us to bring us to Christ will begin. And I've seen this with people who have very little knowledge whatsoever of Christian things. Um, but I've heard people pray the wrong prayers and still become Christians. I've heard people pray all the right prayers and never make it. And I'm convinced that it is this coming to grips with the reality of who you are. And even in secular counseling, that people, we had whole streams of psychiatric treatment where people pointed in other directions. And then uh, about 30 years ago, because there was, it's actually, they ran tests, it was more people recovered by not being counseled than by being counseled. They got worse. And so they said, there's probably some problems with our base. And so as they begin to turn responsibility back for people to take responsibility for their wrong, they begin to see healing come to their lives. And a lot of it is just being honest. The man who began Alcoholics Anonymous was a Christian and, and tried to write up a, a, a basically non-religious statement which would mirror the biblical realities of what it means to become a Christian. You know, um, call on God, whoever you may conceive him he to be is the way it's, or she, it, or pff, hoping that God will go, okay, well, I understand, I suppose. You, know, you might think I'm a purple-violet squish, but I'm really not. But at least if you call, you're talking to something or someone. See that? And this whole thing of standing up and saying, I, I, hello, I'm John, and I'm an alcoholic. It's close. It'd be better to say I'm a wine bibber, a drunkard, and a sinner, but it's close. It, I have a problem with alcoholic beverages. Um, to say I'm an alcoholic is a confession. See that? A public confession. And all of those lines that have brought help to people usually track along the biblical basis of taking responsibility for wrong. Uh, bottom line of this is that if people will simply uh, talk to God, I remember once being in a camp 
And there was a girl there. It was a Christian camp, and it was a Christian girl. She said she was, and you know, I'm not challenging or anything, but she had gone to almost every speaker in that camp, uh, and 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 asked them the same question. She said, "Look, this was the question." Apparently, a couple of speakers said, "There's this girl here, and she's asked me the questions. And he asked everybody else the question. You're the only one that hasn't asked the question yet." So. And she's, she's saying this, like, God's called me to the mission field and I don't want to go. So what do you think? So <laughs> it was boiled down. You know, it took like 10 minutes to say that. But, and then as we were talking, this girl comes. <laughs> she's looking. Heads past all the people. Heads to me and says, excuse me, can I talk to you for a second? So I sit down and I go, can I help you? And she goes, well, I have this problem. So I listen patiently just in case it was another problem. And, and she goes, well, you see, the problem is that God has called me to go to the mission field and I don't want to go. So I said, okay, well, that's fine. Let's just tell him. She goes, what? She said, well, let's just tell God, you know. I said, oh, I, I couldn't do that. And I said, well, why not? You've told everybody else in the camp. <laughs> why, why can't you... Just, I, I, I couldn't do that. I said, look, sure, I'll help you. Hold my hand. <laughs> I said, I want you to pray. Oh, God, oh, God, I know you love me. I know you love me. I know you want the best for my life. You want the best for my life. I know you're wiser than I'll ever be. I know you're wiser than I'll ever be. And I know you call me to go to the mission field. I know you call me to go to the mission field. And I don't want to go. I, I, I. And she went. So anyway, that's, you know. <laughs> There's another camp with some kids, and they're Christian kids. And there was this kid. He was a church kid, but now he's going to be the sheep that ran away. He's going to be the rebel. And actually, one of his relatives was a manager for Steppenwolf in those days. It's one of the um, known step on the grass, Sam, and born to be wild and stuff. So he thought he was pretty cool, cause, you know. And, and now he's going to become a Satanist. See? Yeah, I'm a Satanist. So all his friends... I got all right with God in the camp. They go, you know, friend, he's a, he wants to be a Satanist. We're talking about the law. And I go... Could you talk to him? I said, does he want to talk to me? Said, I want them to take responsibility. He says, you want to talk to me? I'm not going to go over because somebody sicked me on, you know, go get that, we get, get the kid. So I go over and I, and I said, now, he comes up, yeah, yeah, you know, I know these, you know, you can run with God and stuff, but that's not for me. I'm going to be a devil worshiper. That's what he said. I said, oh, really? Yeah, 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 man. I'm like a hard guy. So I said, you got to be talking. No, 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 I'm quite serious. I said, okay, I'll tell you what. We talked for, I don't know, about 10, 15 minutes. No, 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 I'm not into that at all. So I said, uh, excuse me, I've got a piece of paper. I just want to write something. So I wrote, and I said, could you tell me your full legal name, please? And he goes, why? I said, just give me your full legal name. I wrote it. And then I said, uh, I'd like you to just read this through and sign the bottom for me. And he said, what is it? I said, well, this is what it says. I, and there's your name, and is it spelled right? Being of sound mind and sound body, do hereby declare, I do not want God to be my Savior. I do not want, I don't want God to be my King. I do not want Christ to be my Savior and the Holy Spirit my Comforter. Please, I, no, it's it. I bequeath my body to the ground and my soul to its rightful owner, the devil. Please read this at my funeral, signed. And then I gave him the sheet. And he looked at it. Now, if I, this is not a pagan kid. This is a church kid. See that? Like the devil. <laughs> and I said, sign it. He goes, I'm not going to sign that. I said, it's true, isn't it? Why not? I'm going to make you an illustration and a message of mine. I'm going to show the world what happens to a church kid who walks out on the truth. You sign it. He said, no. And I said, then get on your knees and give your life back to God. And he did. <laughs> What is the heart of this thing? It's, it's being honest with God, facing the reality of where you are. By the way, the process of conviction is not to get on your knees and keep groaning until you feel hurt. A lot of people think the way to be convicted is like, an <clears throat> like that. When the scriptures use the word conviction, it's actually an interesting term. It's a legal term. And the word means to sum up all the evidence and present it to the mind. Now, I don't know if you've, there's an old, now we've got law and order where they, you know, the police are trying to do something and the lawyers are trying to get somebody out of something. And, you know, um, but in the old days they had a thing called Perry Mason. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen Perry Mason. Some of you might remember it's an old black and white 
Raymond Burr thing. But every Perry Mason episode was the same. Somebody was killed in the start. See that? Perry Mason's client, who's a lawyer, always is the one that everybody suspected. The DA who had to prosecute the case against Perry Mason's client, who never won a case in the entire series, by the way, always the, the evidence built up until it was sure this person's going to fry in the electric chair. It's not like New Zealand. You died if you got the death sentence. See? So then um, it looks like it's very going, going bad for Perry Mason's client, and this detective who works for him always comes in with some new evidence and talks to the judge and the judge gives a pause for coke which adds life and then there's commercials and then you come back into the courtroom. The last five minutes of every Perry Mason episode was almost identical. So I'm giving you the entire series here in one single minute. Perry Mason always recalls a witness to the stand. I want to recall so and so to the stand. And then this process goes on. Perry looks at him and he goes, you testified earlier that at such and such a time you went to, yes, he says, I did that. And you said also that at such and such a time you did that, yes, I did that. But isn't it also true, he says, that at such and such a time between here and there you were there? I, I, and isn't it also true that you, well, and isn't it also true? And he goes, okay, yes, but I didn't do it. He did, you know, and that's it. And that's the end of the series. The Holy Spirit is like Perry Mason. Only much better. And that's what he does. You testified that, oh, yes, yes, I, I did that. But isn't it all so true? Well, well, yes, but my mother. And isn't it all so true? Well, I, yeah, but. And isn't it all so true? Well, I haven't got any. I've run out of people to blame. <laughs> it's my fault, see that? Boom. That's the process of conviction to sum up the evidence and to lay it before the mind. So sometimes for kids, I've, I've given them a sheet of paper. I said, look, why don't you write down the stuff that stopped you from coming to God? And some kid came back and said, you've got to roll a toilet paper. <laughs> Serious amount of things. I had one girl whose half of her whole room was decorated with shoplifted stuff. And, and she said, yeah, it's going to be really difficult to give my life to God. I said, yeah, you're going to have to pay for that stuff or give it back. Turn yourself in. You may go to jail. Do you know what? For a solid year, she worked. God gave her all kinds of things to pay off, to get enough money to pay for the stuff she'd stolen in her shop. And then I said, go, go to the shop. And uh, she went to this place, and the guy who was in charge of all of the stores, they, she said, I want to see the one in charge. She said, well, you don't mean the main guy? She said, yes, I want to see him. She said, oh, well, he, he's on the other side of town, but he's at the top of this skyscraper thing. I mean, we get. what do you want to see him for? I said, I just need to talk to him. So they usher her up on this big lift and then she, she goes standing before and said, and this is what we told him to say, what you're going to do is take responsibility for what you did. You're going to tell him, you're not going to tell him I'm doing this because I'm a Christian now and I'd like to get out of it if I can. <laughs> you're going to say to him, look, I have done something wrong. I have you know, hurt your store and hurt this business and everything else. Actually, she headed up a shoplifting ring with about five girls. But I, the thing is, you don't talk about other people. You take responsibility for your actions. So she stood there with her little story. And here's a 15-year-old girl standing in front of a guy who's in charge of an entire chain of stores. And she's, you know, he's like customer, young, you know, customer with Good. What do you have to share with me? <laughs> she said, "I want. I need to ask uh, your forgiveness and to turn myself in." She said, "I have stolen a lot of stuff from your store, and I have. Um, I've done this for a long time." She said, "I've earned enough money to pay for the stuff I've stolen, but I need, and I know that that I could go to jail for this, but I need to uh, turn myself in and." And tell you, and he 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 said, "Do you know how much money we lose? How many millions we lose every year from shoplifting?" And I'm thinking, warehouse, with, you know, the poor security guards there, with people are taking half the store out and their underpants and things. You know, it's really hard. Can't even find a, a trolley. Everybody stole those too. <laughs> so he he was mad for about five minutes. And then he and he stopped and he said, well, "But why are you doing this?" So you're allowed to say why if they ask. She said, because I became a Christian and it's wrong. 
And his eyes filled with tears and he said, if there were more kids like you, I would become a Christian. Do you know why we don't affect society? Because we don't teach responsibility. We don't put the elements of repentance that God puts in. We're so keen to have people believe, we forget that biblical belief involves a radical change of life. We do not follow Jesus, who certainly could not be accused of being unloving and hard. When great multitudes went with him and he said, unless you deny yourself, you cannot be my disciple. So all of these biblical incidents, and you can go through and find your own. I picked a few of them out. The Bible's full of them. You can't find places where this isn't. I'd like you to turn now to a part that we could have put earlier than this, but I thought it'd be probably easier now to introduce this to you, and that is section 8 on your deal, and we'll have the PowerPoint up for those of you who haven't got the notes. And uh, and this is something that the church, it, it's called God's laws are not impossible. This is something that the church has had a real big problem with in its preaching and its teaching. Um, I don't know how long I have heard this phrase from preachers of the gospel who ought to know better. And it is this phrase. God gave us good laws, but we are not able to keep them. Or something like that. God gave us good laws, but they are impossible to keep. Have you heard a phrase, something like that, used? I don't know, but in the circles I grew up with, I heard that time and time and time again. In other words, God gave us good laws, but they're actually not that good. And we're, we're dealing with a culture now that has no law at all. And if anybody ought to have some law, and understand what happens. If people have no laws from anybody, they will make up their own laws. Do you know gangs have higher, more scary standards than most churches do? I've seen kids that will fight to defend a piece of ground that's got nothing on it. It's just dirt, but it's theirs. They will die defending this like those... David's mighty man with the bean field. It's just, it's my turf. You don't come here or you die. And people go, you say that I can't I do anything. See that? There are, there are stricter laws and deeper fellowship in most gangs than there are in churches. It costs more to join the gang. When I first went to America and was working with Teen Challenge, I watched a couple of scary movies David Wilkerson put out, Vulture on My Veins and Teen Revolt. I watched gang initiations where kids were stood up against the wall and had other gang members pummel them and stab them just to see if they had the guts to stay in the gang. There's a very high cost that goes up in gangs. One young man going door-to-door -door witnessing in Mexico came across, he didn't know it, a major drug leader, gang leader, a drug dealer guy, but the top of the chain was in this beautiful home. He didn't know, you know. So he's this young guy, and he, his, he's filled with uh, what we're passing on here. He's filled with this. He knocks on the door, and he starts talking to this guy. The guy goes, listen, I'm not into some religious things. Um, I know you're trying to do good and stuff, but listen, if you need a donation, I'll give you some money. But just go away. I'm not interested. He said, I don't want any money. Sure you do, he said. <laughs> Tell you what, whatever organization or thing you church thing you're working for, I'll give you a hundred bucks. Just leave me alone. He goes, I don't want you a hundred bucks. I want to talk to you about your soul. He goes, oh, come on. Listen, I'm serious. What about 500? He goes, I don't want your money. Well, I'll give you 5,000. But here's a guy with like 8 million in his sock. You know what I mean? And he, he, he kept trying to put the price up. He didn't realize he'd run into a kid that didn't have a price. Could have run all day and emptied his house and everybody else's house. This kid would not let him go. And the kid started talking to him about God's laws. And you know how he, this guy got saved? Do you know how he got saved? Because God's laws were tougher than his. And he had great respect for any boss 
who would run a deal t- tougher than his. And it was just that. The kid simply told him the truth. This is what the kid said. If you give your life to this God, you're going to have to make right what you've done wrong. You will not be able to undo a lot of this stuff, but you're going to have to stop, not only just stop stealing, but you're going to have to take back money. <laughs> the guy goes, you've got to be drunk. See that? He just stuck with him. He would not go away. And it turned out that this kid, this guy he was talking to when he was a child had been in a church and was abused by a priest or something and, and uh, got so mad and bitter that he left thing and finally wound up a drug dealer. And then he found a kid who was everything he wanted to be when he was a kid. I'll say this, if you have not got these biblical convictions, you have nothing to say to a terrorist. Most of the young terrorists today that blow themselves up have strong convictions. They believe in law. It's part and parcel of the religion they've been taught. It may not match biblical law, but it'll have an echo in it because the streams are the same. And they realize this, if you're going to serve God, you do what he says. How do you think you're going to put some wussy, compromising, half-shot, religious person just wants you to believe in something against a kid like that who's got explosives wrapped around his waist, he's already had his picture taken, and is going to go straight to heaven if you die? We think we've got a great gospel message. The real one frightens people. I remember, amen, and it's supposed to. It's supposed to. If you're not a little scared, you haven't heard the gospel. Get your money back. So, with that mild, tender beginning, <laughs> what we're looking at here is a basis, biblical basis for order in your life. Remember, the law of God is a security thing. It is a thing of great security. And... Uh, the phrase antinomianism is not a um, familiar phrase to a lot of people today, but antinomian simply means, if in effect, without law. An antinomian is somebody who has no rules in their life and doesn't want any rules in their life. So when we're talking about covenant keeping, which is really the basis of God's relationship with us, is a covenant, just like a marriage. He gives himself to us just like we give ourselves to him. So we've got a choice between here a real covenant between God and people, or no rules at all, no covenants, no, no promises. Do you know how many people in this country just live together without the problem of having some covenantal relationship? I had next-door neighbors that lived with each other for 16 years just to see if it worked out. He has a wonderful statement Josh McDowell makes, and I think it's a marvelous one. And this uh, struck me how many church kids get really rebellious against Christian things. And I think some of the reason is because their parents, who never got saved that way, but now learned the rules, take their children and try to make those rules convert the kid. But remember, rules are a description not a motivation. If a man is put into prison because of his crime, he's convicted and he's put in prison, and you get at least five years for murder, I think. If a man is convicted of his crimes and put in prison, does the knowledge of the law make him a different man? Almost invariably not. Prison becomes a school in which you can learn next time not to get caught. Prison may also become a security where you don't have to face the responsibility of living out in a real world where every day your meals are bought on time and that's why people who come a lot of times out of prison will go straight back in right after. They miss prison. I've met people who would prefer to sleep under a bridge than to take the responsibility of walking. You know, here's a strange thing. Jesus comes to a man who is lame. And he's, he seems keen because like every year he's sort of scrabbled down because there's an angel moving the waters and the first one in after the waters were troubled are healed. But he's always beaten by pole-jumping deaf people and by sprinting blind people because <laughs> he just can't get there in time. Dumb angel. 
So he's waiting there, and then Jesus comes up. He doesn't know who Jesus is. And Jesus looks at him and he says, do you want to be well? Do you think that was kind of a dumb question if you've been there for all these years? That he would probably go, what do you mean do I want to be well? But it is not a dumb question. God doesn't ask dumb questions. God doesn't ask questions of you that he doesn't already know the answers. <laughs> Why does he ask them? Do you want to be well, he says. Because a lot of people are sick because they don't want to be well. When you are well, you have to take responsibility for things. When you're sick, everybody goes, well, he's sick. You understand? Pull responsibility away from a culture. In Marxism, for instance, Francis Xavier used to point out if you have ten brothers working in a family and one of them slacks off, the nine might be able to carry the, the one. But what, are, what if eight of them slack off? What will happen to the other two? They'll go to Australia. <laughs> Do you see, as a society begins to, to move away from what God says, it becomes more and more dependent and more and more in need of security. Now, one of the key things about God's law is that it actually is a safety net. When you know the rules, you can... Do you see that? If you know what gravity is, you're not going to jump off a 40-story building. If you know how it works. If, if I'm an electrician, I'm working with a 40,000-volt line, I'm not going to lick it to see if it's working. You know, if, you're, if you know the rules, there's a safety precaution in there. And, and the law of God is not designed for freedom so much as for security. I wish we had time to show you a, a very weird um, PowerPoint thing I put together. It's called Fractal Prophets, Chaos Minis uh, Fractal Prophets, Quantum Guidance and Chaos Ministries. It's a pretty weird thing. But the base is this, that the universe that we see around us uh, is filled with cause and effect. We we'll call it Newton law, cause and effect instances. The Bible puts it like this. The sun rises on the evil and the good alike. He sends his rain on the just and the unjust alike. It is these laws that give us a sense of security. Because these laws are predictable and repeatable, you are... For instance, if gravity suddenly arbitrarily shifted, what a scary world that would be. What different kind of seats would we have here? You, what kind of different clothes would you have? Magnetic chairs where you lock in and safety belts and your cars would have to like drag themselves along. The, and what if you were caught in a gravity shift just as you walk into your car and you accelerated at 32 foot a second a second into outer space and at 10,000 feet had shifted back again and, ah, and you went down. You would go crazy in a culture like that. In about two weeks, nobody would be alive. So God, in great kindness to us, has given us a world where at least on a, I'll say, on a physical, obvious level, there are cause and effect relationships. So you can, when you sit down, you expect gravity to hold you, you expect the chair to hold you, and you expect various things. It is out of the law of God that we get safety and security. So when a person pulls away from God's law in the name of freedom, they're actually getting out of safety. They're transgressing a boundary. The Bible says, don't murder but a mosquito came into my room last summer. <laughs> was buzzing around. They were always in the dark. And then it stops. That's the scary part when it stops. I waited until it stopped. I gave him one small part of my arm to stop on. <laughs> and then with great anointing, I reached out, bang, and I killed it. Did I murder that mosquito? No, I executed it was a boundary transgressor. It's not supposed to be taken. The Bible says, Whosoever sheddeth blood, his blood shall be shed. I executed him in a righteous way. I'll do that with any rat that comes <laughs> in my house. Yeah? That is not murder. This is what murder is. You glue the mosquito down by his wings. <laughs> you pull off his legs one by one. He loathes me, he loathes me not. That's murder. Okay. David said, how I love your law. It is my meditation day and night. 
Say it again, law is a rule of action. Now, God is the only one who can actually give us these rules because he's the only one who sees the whole thing. If you try to make them up, there's always something you'll leave out of the equation. Many years ago, women were given in this country as well as in other countries a drug to help them in the early stages of pregnancy, which made them feel a lot better and face all these changes that go on in your body when you're pregnant. You guys didn't have to know about this, which was good. But everybody thought it was a wonderful thing. It made the drug companies a large amount of money until the babies began to be born without arms and legs and they took thalidomide off the market until now where they brought it back in for another reason. With a side warning, don't be pregnant when you take this. Now, in the best of intentions, plus the fact that we could make a lot of money, people will put stuff out that is not safe. It is the constant experience in the medical community of people trying new drugs where you have to have five or six or ten or twelve years of study and then literally now hundreds of millions of dollars in order to get it cleared and still down the line people's kidneys start dissolving and their hearts are packing up and something that they overlooked or didn't want to look at in their studies now are killing people. That's not good enough. God is the only one who can tell us what real law is. And when you cut your life off from him, you're left to the arbitrary decisions of the culture in which you live. When Jesus said of John the Baptist, what did you go out in the wilderness to see? The first thing he said is, did you go out to see a reed shaken by the wind? You ever stood on a hill and watched the wind blow? You can't see the wind, but you can know it's real by what it does. And as it moves, here's a stalk of grass. The wind goes, and it goes, wind goes, and it goes. That's what our culture looks like. And people are cool depending on how much of the wind they get. What God is looking for is people when the wind blows, like three little pigs, remember the story? <laughs> Till the wolf goes away. <laughs> Keith Green's first album, we've heard a little bit of Keith earlier. One that shocked a lot of people was No Compromise. And the cover it was a great piece of artwork. It's hard to get good artwork in a CD or something this big. But it had a picture. It looked like ancient Babylon, some despotic ruler being carried with long fingernails through a street. Everybody's all groveling in the streets in front. And there's only one person, you can't see his back, but he looks suspiciously like Jesus. He's just standing like a ramrod in the middle of that groveling crowd. The people beside him are trying to pull him down. They're going, like, you, can't you? you can die like this, trying to pull him down. And the rulers notice him, and he's pointing with his long fingernails, pointing to the soldiers. See that? And the title, No Compromise. Do you know how that spoke to a generation? You know how it'll speak again. Every time the church has got hold of this, an awakening has broken out again. But you will never see God authorize something where we keep blame shifting and keep putting down what he says and in best of intentions say things that not only are stupid and self-centered and unreal, but hurt God. So we have in Scripture these descriptions. It is... The law of God is universal. It's not cultural. The thing that struck me when I first started studying revivals is hearing how tough it seemed that people were when they dealt with people about their sin and then thinking there must be something different about that generation because if I did that, I'd never get away with it. That, remember I mentioned those of you who came to the start. Well... I thought it's a cultural thing, it's a generational thing, it's a time thing, it's a chronological thing. And then I took, I took a risk and took the same things that were preached back then and just thought, this is flat against everything I've said or done before, I'm going to do it anyway, what have I got to lose? <laughs> and I preached and saw exactly the same things that happened back there, and I saw it happen again and again, and I saw it happen in the streets, and I saw it happen in the church, and I realized this isn't cultural at all. This is something that is trans, transcendental to everything. It crosses boundaries. It, it doesn't matter what background. It doesn't matter what culture you come from. It is true. 
that when God says something, it's not just true for you and just true for me. It is true, universally true, something that nobody else can say except him. And that is why God's law is holy, just, and good. There is nothing wrong with God's laws. God's truth descriptions are not options or possibilities. He did not give Israel the ten suggestions. The reason why their commandments... Now, there is a way you can put it. Uh, my friend Bill Garfield has a thing on... He, he, he's, he's actually dealing with the commandments of God in the New Testament, but he calls it non-optional principles. <laughs> so you can use that if you like, non-optional principles. But the fact is, it's a rule. And that's the way it is. It's not an arbitrary rule at all. This is the school of the Lord. Psalm 111, this is one of Joy Dawson's favorite scriptures. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A reverence for God is where it all starts. If you have a reverence for God, uh, the door is open for you to meet the Lord. I've talked to people who are religious people, have no reverence for God at all. I've talked to people, total pagans, some of the scary, scary people who have a fear of the Lord. You're talking about God and their eyes get really big. You'd be amazed how many Islamic people have a fear of the Lord. You're amazed how many Hindu people have a hunger for the supernatural in their lives. And when faced with who Jesus is, turn by the millions. It's happening in our day. The place it's not happening in our day is the Western world because we've been inoculated against what God says by something like the real thing that protects you from the real thing when it comes. And when you think you've already got the real thing and it doesn't do anything, you've got to look for some other thing that's more real. My contention is we need to say what God says and say it without flinching and then watch to see what happens. It is not right to tell people this is Christianity, this is the gospel, and not tell them what God said. To conform to our ideas or what we happen to believe or our personal structures of reality, we have to go back to what he said. And it is my testimony that every time this has happened, in the, in the places of church history I've been able to look at, and not just back in the past, but time and time again in the last 40 years, Every work, every ministry that has grasped hold of this, that didn't know or understand it before, has had a radical reconstruction of their lives and has affected not only that work, but in many cases, the world. The places I long to see it is in our own home country, here. We have come close to revival a number of times in this country. When William Booth sent out two kids from England and said to them, take New Zealand... <laughs> Two kids. One was 20, one was like 18. Take New Zealand. You know what they did? Met in Wellington. You know, it was the capital. They said, let's split up. You take the North Island, I'll take the South. <laughs> I'll meet you in a year. And met a year later with 10,000 Salvationists. How in the world could William Booth send out two kids to take a nation? William Booth and Catherine Booth were steeped in what I'm giving you here. Catherine Booth read the Bible through nine times before she was 12 years old. Catherine Booth, mother of the salvation, you talk about a scary couple. These two kids met each other and looked at each other like, you look radical to me. You are too. <laughs> Catherine Booth was writing tracts when she was 12 years old or 14 years old under an assumed name that were read by tens of thousands of people through Europe under an assumed name, because first, nobody would read anything by a woman, let alone by somebody who turned out to be 12 or 14. But by the time she was a teenager, she had mastered Finney, Wesley, Butler, whole chunks of the early church fathers. That scary little girl became the mother of one of the single most powerful society-transforming works that has ever been born on earth. You might see the Sallies out there collecting money and stuff and think, in America, they've, they're kind of like Santa Claus ringing bells and can you put a diamond? But it's not just clothes and soap. It has to do with a total reconstruction of a world. William Booth wrote, wrote a book called Darkest England and the Way Out. It was a blueprint for reconstruction of 
of England's entire industrial complex, the cities, beginning the cities. And it would have worked. The only problem is a hundred years ahead of its time. I don't want you to be relevant. I want you to be so far ahead of relevant the world will have to catch up. The Salvation Army went to India to minister. They changed their clothes. They put on Indian robes. They took on Indian names. But the British government heard the Salvation Army is coming to India. So they sent an army, of, a detachment of British officers to stop the Salvation Army. They heard they were on the boat. And when they got up, they couldn't see them. They didn't have their British uniforms off, so they blended in the crowd. But later they found out where they were. And one guy came riding up with his pomp and his official things and his horse. And he said, who is in charge here? And the young captain came up. And he said, are you in charge? He said, no. He said, well, I command you in the name of the Queen Empress of India to disband this ridiculous army. And the kid said, in the name of his majesty, king of kings and god of gods and lord of lords, get off your horse. <laughs> we need another generation like that. They don't care what people think about them, who care more about God and fear the Lord more than they fear what people think. And I, I reckon we can have it. He's not changed. He's not any different. Look what he says. The book of the law, it's way back in Joshua, shall not depart out of your mouth. You shall meditate therein day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written. For then you shall make your way prosperous. Then you shall have good success. This is not some handy-dandy success formula. It is a statement of reality. He's saying this. Live the way I say and everything will be awesome. Walk away from it and you're stupid and selfish and unreal. There is, what about ceremonial law? Ceremonial law, um, you know, what about all the, you know, the sacrifices and the doves and stuff? You, you've got to understand something about the law of God. It, it is true, but some parts of it are designed like a kiddie's prime if you're going to teach children stuff. Remember this, Israel, believe it or not, was not always brilliant. They were thicker than most of the people around them. God said, I didn't pick you because you were genetically superior. I picked you because you were the biggest losers I could find. And the reason why you're going to be awesome is because you hang out with me and think like me. And that still goes on today. Why is Israel still in the headlines thousands of years later? Egypt occasionally you'll find because somebody found a mummy. But why is Israel there almost like every second day? Something's happening in Israel again. Because this loser group of people hung out with God. And he said, you're my people. I mean, oh, I don't know what that is, but we're going to do it. <laughs> and when they soaked themselves in what he said, and they started thinking like him, and better started acting like him, the list of what happened was awesome. If you want to read a scary thing, read that description in Deuteronomy. I set before you today a blessing and a curse. Moses was told, when you address the nation, you tell them these are the consequences. If you do this, blessed shall you be in the city, blessed shall you be in the field. He goes through, blessed will you be in these things. He lists, 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 lists. That nations will come against you as one man. They will flee from you in seven directions. I think we need that, don't you? God defend New Zealand because nobody else is going to. Ceremonial law is a visual primer. Think of it as a way to teach people stuff. Now, I've never understood this. The Bible says it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. But when I was a little kid, my cousin Sue's here with us today. My, my grandfather uh, had a farm, a very large farm. And around about Easter one time, I was just a little kid, I saw all my uncles standing around in a, in a kind of a circle with my grandfather. Now, I was pretty small. I was about like this high, and they were all like this high. So I ran up and stuck my head in between these legs to see what they're looking at. What I didn't realize is they were slaughtering a lamb, not for any religious reasons, just to have a lamb dinner. But I'd never seen anything die before. So I'm this little kid like Buddha. <laughs> protect. I ran up and I stuck my head through the legs, 
at the precise moment, there's a lamb. Now, a lamb has got to be the most defenseless looking. They're just lying there like this. You know, little neck back. And they cut his neck and it just blew off. Uh, just as I stuck my head through, the shock was so huge, I never got over it. I ran for like a mile, jumping over hedges and fences. I didn't know what else to do. What would you do? That's called a visual primer. <laughs> In other words, during Bible times, when somebody had done something wrong, you took something special, something that was loved and honored. It wasn't the blood of a sheep or a bull or a dove or something that takes away sin, but it showed you something that you never forgot. And when they took that family pet and it died, Every kid would go, why did he die? And the answer is, for us. He stood in our place. There was some kids who were going to play Noah's Ark, and they had these little toy animals and things. And so they filled a bath up with water, and they turned the shower, and, <laughs> and there was a storm, and flashlight, <laughs> like this. And there's a little ark there with all their little animals in it. And, and he had like two of each one. And, and then they were you know, trying to follow the Bible thing. And so they said, okay, now we, like, we pull the plug and make sure that Noah and the ark doesn't go down the hole. And sort of held it until the, finally the ark rested. And they took the ark out, put it in the bathroom. And, they, and then they're going to bring all the animals out one by one. And then they read, oh, it says they made a sacrifice. So I said, okay, let's do that. And they're going to make a little fire and burn one of their animals. And they said, we can't. We've only got two of those animals. There's supposed to be seven clean ones, you see, and two of the unclean ones. But they, they said, well, we can't afford that. So, oh, that's right. We've got this lamb, this little beat-up lamb. It's got two legs broken off it and an ear missing, and it hardly looks like a lamb at all. But, but we'll get that. And so the kids got this little beat-up wrecked lamb, and they put it on their little fire, and they offered a what? And don't you dare say a sacrifice. You offer God something that costs you nothing. So when they bought those bulls and those goats and those little, they were special. They were special without blemish. Pick them out. The best there is. And when you watch that little thing die, and it all goes back to when the angel of death comes through, one by one he will visit the homes. You take a lamb, you slay it, and put over the doorposts and the lintels. Put it up here, see, of the door. Put it up here, and put it here, and put it here. The doorpost and the lintels, top and the two sides. And it runs down, and you have a cross. A cross of blood that stood between the destroying angel and what happened to Egypt's firstborn where there was no blood. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And every Jewish family understood that. And they just, they did their little festivals and they did their things following a ritual that had been given to them for thousands of years, carefully following the thing, paying particular attention to all the little details of the thing. It's a primer. It's not the thing, but it is a statement in visual art, if you like, of the reality. I cannot explain to you, nobody can, all the details of what the cross means to God. But we will have a crack at it, and we'll do the best we can. i just say this to close up our section here, that the law of God boils down to this. Law has sanctions. Those are, you can either tell a person, like, this is the way and you're not supposed to do this. And you can put a sanction on the top of it so people know it's not just if you do this, it'll be bad, but I will make it bad for you if you do it. You understand what I'm talking about? A, a thing when you don't understand the purpose of the thing, but somebody puts it on and says, this is a law, you can't do anything you want. If you drive too fast, you could kill yourself. 
But it, the thing that makes that a law is they say, if you drive too fast, you will be arrested, we'll take your license off you, and you will go to jail if you keep doing it. That's a sanction. The penalty is intrinsic in the law. If you drive too fast, you will kill somebody, maybe yourself, maybe somebody else. One day, that may happen to you. The sanction is added to protect, make sure you know that law is not a suggestion. Ignorance may be pardoned in the Bible, but it still auto-occurs its own penalty. You can't get away with breaking the law. So here's the end of the thing. Knowledge equals responsibility. Jesus said, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, we see. Therefore, your sin remains. Responsibility accepted equals further light. Responsibility rejected equals guilt and consequence. To him that has, more shall be given. You obey what God shows you, he'll show you more. You turn away from what he's given you, then little by little you'll start losing what light you have. It is a scary responsibility to listen to God because you become responsible. God bless you.